Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our April webinar. Um, if you um, are interested in having interpretation services to listen in French, we have that available. Um, you can click on the little globe icon at the bottom of the screen. Um, today, we are really excited to have a team of graduate students with us from the University of Michigan School for Environment and Sustainability, also called SEAS. So you'll hear us use that acronym a lot throughout today. Um, as you know, the, the Great Lakes and St. Lawrence Cities Initiative is um, really engaged around a lot of coastal resilience issues, and this is a strategic initiative for us. And so we were really excited about a year and a half ago to come together with this, this team of students to kind of expand our capacity around coastal resilience research. And these students have been basically doing a deep dive into the landscape of coastal resilience resources over the past 16 months. So they are really sort of experts on this subject now and are very close to some of them graduating next week. Um, and we're really excited to hear their findings from their research. So just some background on kind of the University of Michigan and the SEAS program. Uh, graduate students have the opportunity to complete a master's project instead of a thesis, which is really more of a kind of real world applied sort of working and research experience where students are paired with clients. So the students came into partnership with us along with um, our partners at the NOAA Office for Coastal Management to really complete this really awesome and collaborative project. So just some background on that. Um, and then the student team is made up of six students, but we have two today that are presenting and I'll just briefly introduce them before we jump in. So today we're joined by Kat Cameron. Kat is a second year graduate student at SEAS and at the Taubman College of Urban Planning. So she's getting a dual degree in environmental policy and planning as well as a degree in urban and regional planning. So she's got another year left at U of M. She received her undergrad in conservation biology and environmental studies from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And she actually has previously spent some time in the film industry as a lighting technician and producer, but now she focuses on assisting Great Lakes communities and creating their own stories of resilience in the face of climate change. So Kat Hills from Northern Wisconsin is a master rain gardener and an avid bike commuter. And then also we are joined today by Andrea Payne. So Andrea is a soon to be graduate from SEAS next week with a master's in environmental policy and planning. Um, in addition to being a student at SEAS, Andrea is a program, program coordinator at the um, Huron River Watershed Council in Ann Arbor, Michigan, where she facilitates water quality programs, regional stormwater collaboration, and community engagement efforts. In her early career, Andrea has spent time working with a number of Great Lakes organizations, including the Great Lakes Fishery Commission, NOAA's Great Lakes Environmental Research Laboratory, so plural, and then also at our very own Great Lakes and St. Lawrence Cities Initiative. So good to have her back today. And then Andrea is a Michigan native and was born and raised along the coast of Lake Michigan in Manistee, Michigan. So welcome Kat and Andrea. We're excited to have you today and I'll turn it over to you to um, kick off our, our presentation. Well, hi everyone. Thank you for that introduction, Tori. Um, and also hello to all the faces that uh, for all the people that we already know or may have interviewed, thank you for showing up. Um, as Tori just said, my name is Kat and Andrew and I will be presenting on our research, um, an assessment of coastal resilience in the Great Lakes communities, basin-wide resources and local efforts in response to a changing coastline. This um, project was part of a capstone project for the University of Michigan School for Environment and Sustainability. And we worked with our clients, um, the Cities Initiative and also NOAA's Co Office for Coastal Management. Oh, oh wait has it okay there we go sorry if it doesn't change please just interrupt me and let me know um, so a rundown of what we'll talk about today is we'll first go over the background and like what really catalyzed this research and why it's important now and then we'll talk about what we did for 16 months of doing research followed by the results and some of the common themes we saw and then andrea will finish off with recommendations that we developed so as the largest freshwater system in the world, the Great Lakes and St. Lawrence River watershed is an essential resource that drives the cultural, ecological, and economic well-being of central Canada 
and the Midwestern United States. The Great Lakes are the lifeblood of the region and support nearly 40 million people. And I am proud to say that I'm from at least the Midwest um, adjacent. Um, so as we all know, they hold about a fifth of the available fresh water in the world. And we utilize the Great Lakes for their many resources, including supporting industries um, such as manufacturing, ag agriculture, and mining that rely on the basin's waters for shipping and transport, irrigation, and hydropower. Um, recreation and tourism are also vital to many of our city's economies as well. However, climate change is affecting the Great Lakes more and more. The increases in storm intensity and frequency um, have caused flooding and damaged infrastructure. And climate change has the potential to greatly stress coastal communities and stretch their budgets while trying to pay for and cover the costs of repairing inadequate and then damaged coastal infrastructure. And the question is, why now? Why are we doing this research in this exact moment? Well, as many of you probably know, there were low water levels in 2013 and 2014 across the basin. And then following that 2017 through 2020, the region experienced high precipitation and river inflow that led to record high water levels. This led to coastal flooding and erosion and damaged critical infrastructure, as, long, as well as disrupting shipping and recreational uses of the lakes. I'm sure many of you are here actually because your communities were affected by these high water levels and you have personal stories about um, the ways that you had to deal with them. There are many consequences that came out of these high water levels. There is now a huge amount of interest in tackling these issues and political interest is peaking as well as responses from agencies and organizations across the basin. However, we know that there's a short period of time and will these people, will people be as interested in dealing and with coastal resiliency about 10 years from now, we don't know, which creates a problem of urgency. Private landowners want to protect their homes and their properties, and municipalities also want to protect infrastructure and maintain the public space along shorelines. And we can't be for sure what we can't be sure what future water cycles will look like and will look like, and we'll need to act now before it fluctuates again. And finally, there's been an inpouring of resources. Um, both funding and informational while people are trying to do this work. Capacity building organizations are creating toolkits and holding webinars. And there's new funding as well, such as New York's uh, Coastal Lakeshore Economy and Resilience Initiative or CLEAR initiative that came about from these high water levels. However, there are obvious challenges to this. There are because of all this new information that's come about, there's not a lot of coordination between uh, organizations and different sectors. So people are doing a lot of work, but it might be duplicative and it could be focused more to create fewer resources so people knew which to use. And finally, there's a short period of time while people are interested. This excitement wants, like pushes everyone to get to work and to have an impact. However, this also means um, that we only have a short period of time to capture political, like politicians and residents' interests before they are no longer interested in putting time or tax dollars into this effort. And finally, in the urgencies, um, in the urgency to do this work, we also have to remember that this hasn't, we haven't always included everyone at the table. And we need to make sure that we're not just bouncing back from climate impacts, but we're actually bouncing forward and considering equity and everyone's impacts. To address this, we developed three objectives. Compile and assess existing coastal resiliency information and resources and funding opportunities. Two, identify enabling and constraining factors and how equity is a, uh, enabling constraining factors of local resilience work in the Great Lakes and St. Lawrence Basin and make recommendations to local governments and Great Lakes practitioners for how to effectively and collaboratively advance future coastal resilience work. And now Andrea will explain how we started that work. Hello everyone. So I'll be diving into the process and results from our first objective, which is to compile and assess coastal resiliency informational resources and funding. So I'll first dive into our resource library and analysis. So our goals in the resource compilation was to understand the ecosystem of current resources available on coastal resilience to support local action and projects. 
And then additionally, we wanted to identify gaps and needs to inform future resource development by what we will be calling resource providers. And that includes our clients, the Great Lakes St. Lawrence Cities Initiative and the NOAA Office for Coastal Management. And the outcome of this work was a library of informational, educational, and data resources related to climate adaptation, flood mitigation, coastal resilience, and many more topics. And so we compiled pretty much any informational resource that we could get our hands on that could support municipalities' work and journeys on coastal resilience. And in the end, it'll serve as this one-stop location for a vast number of existing resources. Next slide, please. So in total, we compiled over 1,000 resources in a spreadsheet library. And two team members, myself and my colleague, Anna, conducted digital research to identify applicable resources. We looked across over 130 organizations and hubs in both the US, Canada, and even beyond those two countries. And that included federal agencies in US and Canada, state and provincial agencies, local governments, nonprofits, think tanks, academic institutions, consulting firms, planning agencies, and many more. The entire list of those organizations that we looked at is an appendix in our full report, if you're interested in where we looked. And we reviewed websites, existing toolkits, documents, um, current resource libraries to collect relevant information to include in this resource library. And overall, we found webinars, fact sheets, clearinghouses, newsletters, maps, data, reports, planning guides, trainings, and toolkits. So there's really a lot out there in the coastal resilience space, climate adaptation space to support local action on coastal resiliency. And each resource that we selected was then cataloged and characterized using 22 attributes. So there is some objective information that we included, things like the resource name, the creating organization, the language in which it's in, access instructions, the date created, and the topic addressed. And then our team analyzed each resource for additional attributes, including the time required to use or digest the information of the resource, the reading level, the accessibility of that resource, so specific things like payment or membership that may be needed to access that resource. And then also we evaluated each resource for its consideration of other relevant topics, including climate change and social equity. Next slide. We also conducted an analysis on our resource library and total we found that 32 different topics were covered by the resources that we found. Most of our resources focused on adaptation planning, flooding, and high water levels, which that makes sense because those are really the most hot button issues identified by municipalities in the Great Lakes and St. Lawrence Cities Initiative's uh, Coastal Needs Assessment Survey, which our research, our, our research really followed up on the work that the Cities Initiative and the University of Illinois laid the groundwork for. Um, in addition, we found that 65% of our resources were text-based and delivered using formats such as websites, reports, or fact sheets. We found very few audio or photo-based resources such as podcasts and infographics. Related to equity, we found that 78% of resources do not explicitly consider racial or social equity. And of the 21.8% that do, only 25 or 25% are not specific on what equity concern is addressed. We found that nonprofit organizations and communities of practice were particularly successful at integrating equity considerations into their resources. Geographically, 44% um, of the resources covered the Great Lakes Basin in some form. 35% of resources were U United States focused and only 8% were Canadian specific focused. Wisconsin and Michigan were by far the states that were most frequently targeted in resources. And then we found that the St. Lawrence River in Quebec were rarely mentioned in resources with only 1.1% of resources uh, looking at the St. Lawrence. Um, for the resource creators, most of the resources were created by the federal government and then followed by states and provinces producing 19% and then collaboratives producing 17%. And then 70% of our resources had an explicit or implied target audience. 
And mostly we're trying to target municipal staff and elected officials, but 26% of the resources were geared towards municipal or coastal planners, and only 2% were targeted at engineers. Um, readability, most all of the resources had a moderate to simple level of readability and only 9% required specialized knowledge. And in total, we found that the time investment or time needed to um, digest or, or comprehend that resource was on average 1.3 hours. And then re regarding language, 94% of our resources were available in English. And then lastly, looking at accessibility, most all the resources, 98%, um, were available in a single delivery or access form, and then only 6% required any payment, membership, or login to access. Next slide, please. So we also developed a recommended resources library, and the goal of this was to develop a library that was more useful, manageable, and external facing for municipal, municipalities and coastal resilience implementers. So to distill the comprehensive library down to a recommended resources library, we used a suite of evaluation criteria. We looked at the usability of that resource, making sure there weren't any paywalls or barriers to access. We looked at the quality of that resource, making sure that it was produced by reputable organizations. And then lastly, the relevance. So it's applicability to current coastal issues, making sure that it was a current publication date, integrated the most recent information, data, and research. And then in total, we found that um, 188 resources were recommended, and that was around 20% of our comprehensive resources library. And we organize, organized that based on 11 different topics. Next slide. So the second prong of our objective one, which is compiling and assessing coastal resiliency information, resources, and funding, was, as I just said, looking at the funding ecosystem on Great Lakes coastal resiliency. So our goal here was to analyze and assess the existing gaps and needs in the funding space, specifically answering the question, where do municipalities need more support in the grant procurement process? So we, list, we listed emerging and existing funding sources for coastal resilience work in the US and Canada. And as a result, we developed a, a funding library, which was a comprehensive location for the most reliably and regularly available funding opportunities to support the design, construction, and implement, implementation of coastal resilience projects. Next slide. In total, we found 130 funding opportunities. And compared to the resource library, we took a much more selective approach here rather than the comprehensive approach we took with the resource library. We really wanted to emphasize current opportunities from 27 or 2019 to 2021 fiscal years and include only the most up-to-date information because um, we know funding priorities and application processes regularly change. Um, and we also prioritized well-established programs that routinely offer funding. And then as an overview, each resource that we found was cataloged and characterized using different 45 attributes. Similar to the resources library, we looked at the geographic region covered, the topic addressed, the time and investment required. And then we also looked at many other attributes, including total appropriated funds, any match requirements, and eligibility. Next slide. And here's some of our main takeaways from the analysis of the funding library. We didn't do a quantitative analysis similar to the resources library because we did use a more selective approach. Um, but we did use we did conduct a qualitative analysis to develop practical information and tools on funding, including points of contact, application requirements, database URLs, and pilot projects. So some of our takeaways are that the term resilience is rarely used when advertising grants, and that this term is not widespread in the funding ecosystem yet. We also identified that funding availability varies based on where you are. So there are massive state and provincial discrepancies based on politics and state taxes. And then on a federal level, we found that most funding for coastal resilience comes from the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative in the United States. And then we also found a lot of challenges with operating and accessing funding from the Federal Emergency Management Agency. A few last takeaways from our funding analysis was that partnerships and relationships are key, and that working with partner organization is 
really helpful in easing grant administration burdens. And stewarding relationships throughout the funding process is really important. And then lastly, the upcoming infrastructure investment and jobs bill funding is likely to provide a lot of money on coastal resilience and an anticipated six billion in the US. And so hopefully this is a big opportunity and um, folks can take advantage of this over the next few years in the United States. Next slide. Okay, thanks Andrea. I'm gonna cover what we did um, in terms of the other objectives. So, we did, for the majority of our other research was based on interviews and talking specifically to people about what the gaps were and their needs were. Um, this followed up with objective one, which is an identifying enabling and constraining factors of local coastal resilience work. And the deliverable that came out of it is our charming 93 page long report that includes recommendations uh, for our clients as, long, as well as resource providers and practitioners and municipalities across the basin. For our resource provider interviews, we actually did interviews and also um, focus groups. We interviewed 18 people from 16 different organizations and agencies that represented state, provincial, and federal agencies, collaboratives, boundary organizations, nonprofits, and academic institutions. And our two focus groups were with the Coastal Zone Management Program and also Sea Grant that covered about 30 people. We developed this list of who we're able to interview based off who our clients knew. Um, and we're also able to include, or however, we're only able to include two Canadian organizations and only one Indigenous commission. For our implementation interviews, we based our questions off, to, off of the Coastal Resilience Needs Assessment Survey by the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. And we developed a series of themes that we've put all the questions into that included impacts and response, funding and financing, resources, communication of outside information and also outside networks, long-term planning, equity and success. And you can see some of the questions here. One of my favorite questions that we asked at the very end, and I probably asked some of you this, was what does long-term coastal resilience look like in your community? And I often would add, what's your dream? And what came out of that were some of the most interesting answers. And as you'll see later, one of the biggest themes was public access. And truly it's about maintaining the relationship with the lakes. That's what we want to see in the end goal of coastal resilience. So who we interviewed, we interviewed 44 people across um, through 41 interviews. So also if you're here, which I've already mentioned, thank you for letting me talk to you or my teammate, Annika, or one of our other teammates who might've jumped in talk to you for an hour. Uh, we really appreciated that. And obviously this is why we're here now. The majority of our representation, as you can see from this map, was in Michigan and Wisconsin, mostly Lake Superior and Lake Michigan, um, which makes sense because that's relative about the same amount of coastline that we would have um, relative to the number of interviews. We were lacking representation from uh, indigenous communities and also New York and Quebec. We had fewer interviews from them. Um, but we did have representation, obviously, from every lake and the St. Lawrence River and Lake St. Clair as well. Uh, I think some of the issues with dealing with or trying to convince St. Lawrence uh, River communities to speak to us is that they didn't always feel a part of the Great Lakes and they weren't a part of the basin. So they didn't think that participating in our research would be as worthwhile. And they also thought they were experiencing probably different problems than the rest of the basin. But also, we didn't actually ever sit down and interview them, or we only interviewed one, so we don't have a full picture of them. After that, we transcribed all of the interviews, and then we coded them to do qualitative analysis. These are all of the codes, or probably most of the codes they ended up using. We pulled out chunks and themes that we saw and identified them and started to look at individual codes. As you can see in the very center, funding and financing, that was brought up probably the most out of any code or any theme across all the interviews, including the resource provider interviews. It's a huge hot topic. Um, we can tell it it's the front of everyone's mind. Towards the outside, you can see that some of the codes that are smaller might relate back to if it only, only has interviews from certain areas or were more like municipal specific interviews. And 
this, all of this work led to our final results and recommendations that we'll cover now. From the interviews, we developed six major, major themes that we covered. Community, confusion, control, capital, capacity, and connection. Yes, they're all Cs. We did that on purpose. Um, but I'll talk a little bit about each of those and how we got, like what information we were looking at, and then we'll start looking at some of the takeaways. In terms of community, we were looking at the impacts on communities. And actually, pretty early on in the interviews, we realized that we couldn't spend too much time on these, uh, on this question of like, what impacts have you seen in your community? Because it was so fresh in people's minds and also like had been almost like traumatic for many of these like municipal staff of how do we do this and how do we do this work that we would spend almost the entire interview on and we wouldn't get to actually talking about solutions. We had to, after a while, like we had to just like say, nope, we can't talk about that anymore because we knew everyone is struggling with coastal resiliency and is struggling with the impacts of climate change in their community. Um, community also related to the attitudes that people had towards climate change as well as green infrastructure, as well as the impact of timing, such as uh, the timing of election cycles and grant cycles, as well as the high water cycles. Uh, and these high water cycles and all these different cycles that are playing an impact, like having an impact, also cause residents to have short term memories in terms of um, as the water fluctuated, their urgency may also decrease. And they might be less interested in putting tax dollars towards projects if they don't really remember the impacts of high water as much. In terms of confusion, I'm sure many of you also know, but climate change and also coastal management is complex. Um, it's difficult to understand what to do and therefore how to, like what pro, like what should be the focus of your projects. And sometimes it wasn't just municipal staff that didn't know what to do or how to understand something. Your go-to consulting or engineering firm also might not have expertise in a niche area of like coastal, um, coastal resilience. Another big point of confusion was who to contact, how to start this work. <laughs> Often municipal staff didn't know who to turn to if they had a question on the application either, which held them up and prevented them from potentially being successful. In terms of control, communities had a, that had a greater proportion of public shoreline were able to do more work and implement larger scale projects but also protecting private property owners or protecting private property was often left up to the owners and their own financial abilities. And we also saw that planning documents can either enable or restrict coastal work. In terms of capital, which as we know is a big deal, uh, we mostly focus on trying to understand how to best apply for grants and also work within the cycles. We also saw that match dollars and project-based funding could be barriers to people getting grants. For capacity, staff and financial capacity truly had an impact. It determined how much match dollars you had and also how much information you could do and whether or not you even had time to apply for grants. Uh, to, also to increase your staff capacity, you would need more funding capacity. So you already had a limit <laughs> sometimes. And finally, connection. There seemed to be a missing link between resource providers and municipalities. We also saw the importance and benefits of working with nearby municipalities, as well as forming strong relationships with outside agencies and also your political representatives. So to go a little bit more in depth on uh, some takeaways and that Andrew will use as reference for the recommendations. Something we saw was that there's a reactiveness to this work. When the high water goes up, it freaks people out and you wanna do something. And it doesn't emphasize the long-term and value-based approach that would be that, that would have more sustainable outcomes. Also, this reactiveness sort of leans into hard um, hardening your shorelines instead of thinking of more nature-based solutions. And people don't always understand that those hardened shorelines actually have impacts on neighboring communities as well, or just your neighbors. Uh, this prevented our Municipalities were prevented from making long-term plans due to also to the short-term memories of residents. Information is siloed across different agencies. As I said, sometimes the work is duplicative or it could be more focused. There's little communication of what's going on. 
We heard from our interviews how many other agencies and organizations were doing similar work on coastal resilience. And I actually just sat in an, in an interview a week ago and I heard that a different organization was doing very similar work to what we had done and what I had heard many other people had also done. So it's happening in many ways. It's just, we could be concentrating the effort potentially. There is an overwhelming amount of information. Clearly over a thousand resources is a lot. And how do we pick up what's gonna be best and most applicable? for what the work you wanna do. You also uh, want to save time and not waste too much time going through things. As Andrea said, there's, it's about one over an hour to go through a single resource. And we wanna, uh, or we saw that municipalities really struggled with trying to figure out what was most applicable, relevant and usable. Capacity was also a huge thing. Capacity was a theme that we pulled out nearly immediately in the interviews. It's evidence that even well-intentioned staff struggled to find the time to sift the resources and apply for grants. And whether a municipality has one full-time staff member or a whole engineering and planning department, staff never felt like they had enough time to properly address resiliency planning and the work that they needed to do. Other takeaways were um, this missing middle person. There seemed to be this gap between resource providers and funders who had the information and who had the money and the municipalities that desperately needed it. Um, and it, there's actually a quote from some one of the, one of the scholarly, scholarly articles that we looked at that says that having a connection or a missing middle person is almost as important as the physical and engineering solutions to coastal hazards. They're truly a vital part of what the work we need to do. In terms of funding, having a grant writer on staff increased the ability of a municipality to have successful grant applications, um, but simply just having knowledge and grants really improved that as well. It was recommended that you identify your community sweet spot, which would be a manageable award amount, uh, relevant project type, and alignment with goals and needs for your project. This reduced the effort of applying to multiple grants and focused on the ones that be, they'd be most likely successful at. Another big takeaway was that relationships matter. So intermunicipal relationships, such as sharing knowledge between staff, but also between departments within a single municipality, but also across boundaries and talking to your neighbors as well. You're able, not only can you share information, but you can also potentially split um, costs for a project. Uh, Fostering relationships with agency staff also increased successful project planning and implementation, and even having a relationship with your government representative matter, showing them that you had, how your shoreline was impacted might not get you immediate results, but then they'd be, or you would be in their mind when they went to go tackle these issues. And they might keep you up to date on new funding sources that are coming in or advocate for you. And finally, another takeaway that we saw was equity. There seemed to be an equity disconnect. Municipalities could identify people that would be vulnerable, whether it be property owners or um, indigenous communities, but they didn't automatically see it as an equity issue. Um, and I don't know, or we didn't decide if that was due to, to equity be usually, being usually referred to as like a racial like problem or related to race, rather than seeing the vast array of people that could be vulnerable and how that relates to equity. And I'm gonna pass it off to Andrea for the recommendations. Thanks, Kat. So based on the outcomes of objectives one and two, or our interviews, resource analysis, and funding analysis, we developed recommendations to satisfy our third objective. And as a reminder, our objective three is to recommend strategies for effective and collaborative coastal resilience work. So along the top in the dark blue boxes, you will find the primary challenges which Kat mentioned as part of our results. And then below in the gray boxes, you will find a few key recommendations aimed at tackling that challenge. We do have many more recommendations, but obviously could not fit them all on this slide. So certainly check out our report to get the full picture of the suite of recommendations. So starting on the left-hand side, um, we recommend that municipalities embody the long-term view on coastal resilience, despite changes in politics and water levels. So that includes conducting long-term coastal planning and monitoring, identifying and prioritizing potential coastal projects, and including those projects in capital improvement plans, 
and also developing shovel ready designs so that you can be ready to go when a funding or grant opportunity arises. Moving towards the middle, we recommend all stakeholders more actively work to cultivate binational basin wide communication, relationship building, and information sharing. And that includes proactively fostering relationships and establishing lines of two way communication before situations arise. A very common theme in our interviews was that municipalities felt like resource providers should be contacting them, and resource providers felt that municipalities should be talking to them. So it was very much like a who's on first situation and pointing of fingers. So having those two way lines of communication and establishing those relationships before high water level events is really important to us, we feel. In addition, establishing a designated staff person at a resource provider organization to serve as that missing middle person that Kat identified. And that person would serve as the conduit or liaison between municipalities and other organizations or levels of government. And lastly, this recommendation includes holding a, recommend, a regular sub-basin or basin-wide summit or conference to synergize efforts among localities and share successes and challenges. And then moving on to the right-hand side, we recommend resource providers identify a primary hub for coastal resilience resources and build the capacity of existing sub-hubs. And underneath that recommendation, we uh, recommend that resource providers identify one organization to host, manage, and update a centralized resources hub, that they improve the usability and searchability of hubs, that they consult with target users during resource development and evaluation, and that they conduct social research to understand current and potential uses of resources and hubs. Next slide, please. So starting on the left-hand side, uh, we recommend educating coastal communities about coastal and climate processes and potential resilient solutions. So both local governments as well as residents. And that includes for municipalities, engaging residents in coastal planning to ensure solutions are relevant and broadly supported by your community and members of the public. For resource providers, that means establishing a grassroots stewardship program to cultivate on the ground local champions and maintain momentum towards coastal resilience on all properties. As Kat mentioned, many communities are constrained in the amount of control that they have over implementing coastal resilience solutions. So making sure that you are thinking of out of the box solutions to inspire coastal resilience action on private properties as well. And then the last two recommendations on this slide are focused on financial capacity and funding. And our recommendations include investing in regional scale grant writing support and technical expertise to support municipalities, ensuring that resource providers are an accessible go-to expert on funding and on launching projects. As we said, many folks didn't know who to turn to, and so ensuring that there is a single helpline or contact list so localities know exactly who to call at which organization. Further recommendations include identifying potential local partners to ease the burden of project administration on municipalities. And then also on a larger funding structural level that includes removing barriers to improve accessibility to funding and financing. And more explicitly, that means more heavily weighting applications from disadvantaged communities or applications that integrate social equity considerations. It also means widening grant avail availability and eligibility. Then lastly, that means removing match and other cost sharing requirements for disadvantaged communities. Next slide. So our last suite of recommendations are related to the integration of equity in coastal resilience work. And we recommend that all resource providers embody a basin wide view. So thinking more on an ecosystem scale rather than on an organization scale. So that includes thinking beyond your own organization's geographic scope or membership when developing resources. We found that a lot of Canadian municipalities very frequently used US-based resources from organizations like NOAA. 
And so making sure that US-based organizations are considering the Canadian perspective and seeking feedback from Canadian stakeholders when developing resources. Because as I am indicated with the resource library analysis, only around nine to 15% of our resources were explicitly Canadian focused. In addition, we recommend increasing French translation of resources to ensure Quebec stakeholders can access information. Um, that was an added barrier for a lot of Quebec municipalities to be able to get the info that they needed to implement coastal resilience solutions. And then we also recommend making resources available in different delivery formats to promote universal access. So not just making sure that you need Wi-Fi to access resources, but allowing folks to access resources on mobile devices and across many different types of resource delivery platforms. And then lastly, for municipalities, we recommend consulting with tribes and other marginalized groups early and often when developing projects. So that includes allocating time to listen, learn, and build relationships with these groups, and also integrating consideration of traditional ecological knowledge into project ideation. Next slide. So our full length report is now available. And we'll provide a link to that in the chat for you all to go access that and dig in if you would like. There's a lot more information there that follows up on a lot of the things that Kat and I mentioned today. And then we are also developing a user facing report that is still in the midst of being finalized. And that is a shorter five to 10 page report aimed at municipalities and local entities. And that will be ready in the next few weeks and we'll certainly share with the attendees of today's webinar as well as our interviewees. And then lastly, our permanent home for the resources and funding libraries are still being determined by our clients. But if you are interested in either of those libraries now, please contact Kat and myself and um, we'd be happy to share that with you. Last slide. Thank you all so much for listening today. It was a pleasure to share our research with you all. And at this time, we'll take any questions that you have. So it looks like we do have a question, a few questions in the chat that I'll hop in and answer right now. So um, Jim asked, why such a low percentage of technical resources? Um, that's a really good question and something that I felt is a potential gap in resources is that oftentimes resources aim to be broad and to hit a lot of different target audiences, but sometimes are not getting the degree of technical specificity needed to train and improve coastal resilience comprehension and understanding for groups like engineers and uh, contractors that are doing most of the implementation of this work. And then Dave McDowell, yes, this presentation will be shared and it will also be recorded. Mindy, I see you have a question. Hey, thank you. Um, this was a great run through. At times, I have to admit, you know, um, it brought back a little trauma of just being two years into a municipal career and you brought out some things that were really stressful. Um, and so I just want to point out um, the recommendation to engage the public and the community more around coastal resiliency planning. It seems counter to the fact that we don't have capacity and we don't have funding. So, how do we engage the public? When we go out and engage with the public, and we start to make plans, I think it's a reasonable expectation of them to think that, oh yeah, that's what the city's gonna work on and I'm gonna see progress. When that progress doesn't happen due to the lack of capacity and the lack of funding, we lose trust and um, support. And so it's, it's really difficult for me to see, you know, the recommendations and one of them to be, go out and engage your community and coastal resiliency planning. It's like, well, we don't have the money and capacity to get everything done we're gonna disappoint a bunch of people. And then that makes our jobs harder. So I don't know how to solve that, but maybe that's an idea you could kick around in your recommendations or future work. Um, just wanna put that out there. But this was uh, a very enjoyable hour to hear how many people you talk to 
the, uh, I guess I've, you know, pursued maybe a dozen of those 188 resources, you know, I got a lot of work to do. So uh, just really thank you. This was really an interesting hour. Thank you so much, Mindy. Um, I'll hop in first and then Kat can add on. So that second recommendation for the engaging the community is for the resource provider organizations, so not the communities, to launch this sort of train the trainer model on uh, coastal stewardship. So this model exists already for inland lakes across the Great Lakes Basin and Midwest. And so we're encouraging these organizations to develop a similar model for coastal management. And so hopefully that sort of a model would actually cultivate local champions who could do a lot of that on the ground work on behalf of the communities and serve as those uh, community-based experts so that the localities are not having to be the point people all the time, nor are the resource providers. So it's really a means of establishing a coastal resilience culture at all levels. Um, Kat, if you have anything else to add, please chime in. I guess I first want to say I'm sorry if that just dug up a lot of like painful memories. It it truly, like I said in the beginning, we had to actually stop like letting people talk so much about the impacts because I could tell that people were just so, um, it, it was overwhelming and exhausting and probably still is. So I guess I don't have much to add besides that I don't think that always engaging with your community has to show that you are like working towards a project. Obviously you have far more experience in, in municipalities than I do since I'm still a graduate student. But I think as Andrew just said, creating this idea of like um, having coastal resilience be a thing in people's minds at all times and when they're making decisions. So when that does come up again, they aren't surprised and say, oh wow, high water, how did that happen? And they actually remember how to act and what to do and will support funding if it comes up in the future. But also, as we know, there's a short period of time in which they'll be truly interested. So thank you for that question. I can add on that just to kind of bring together this, this partnership between the students and the cities initiative, because your research is really helping us build a foundation of how to kind of guide and direct some of our programs. So I can say that in this year ahead, we're getting ready to launch some working groups under our mayor's advisory council on coastal resilience. Um, one of those groups will be looking at kind of these uh, interplay between public entities and private homeowners or landowners. And we're hoping to kind of look at some case studies to see how communities are successfully doing that, because we understand that that is still a big challenge, um, kind of more so anecdotally that we've heard on our end from many of our member cities, and that it seems like there aren't necessarily a lot of resources out there to guide that process. So we're hoping to um, advance that a little bit more, and I'm looking forward to diving into the full report and looking at your recommendations to see how that might guide that particular working group that we're hoping to, to move forward in the coming weeks. Bridget, you have a question. Hey, thank you so much for your presentation today. Um, so yeah, I'm. it's kind of an observation and question. And so I'm just sort of thinking through like that resource hub and like that centralizing of that. How do we figure out who should do that? And are there, have you found any models out there on other topics um, and, or in other areas that you could maybe provide a little bit of a recommendation in that area to us? Yeah, we actually uh, provided in the report a explicit model that we think is a really, really great option. Um, so it's called Gulf Tree and it's based on uh, Gulf area resources. And in some ways it serves as, as a BuzzFeed quiz of sorts, like what, what topic are you interested in? Like what organization do you represent? And it, and it allows for interested stakeholders to click through and find resources that they want. Um, but to answer your first question, how to go about identifying that centralized hub, uh, my recommendation would be identifying the current landscape of hubs. So who is currently trying to pull together coastal resiliency resources? Obviously, NOAA's Digital Coast is like what comes to mind first, but obviously it's also being done on a state level um, and by a lot of these other boundary organizations and resource providers. So 
I would recommend kind of doing an, an assessment of the existing landscape of these hubs, which we have kind of done that as well, but then kind of getting a sense of like, who does have capacity, who does have technical expertise and where that would be best suited. I can also add in that the golf tree, which we did actually debate if that was going to be our end deliverables, if we should make, we call it a BuzzFeed quiz. Sorry if that's not a reference that works for you, um, but an online quiz of sorts where you can sort of like, you click through like this applies to me, right? And then, but we realized that one, we don't have the coding skills and two, we only have 16 months. However, the golf tree is actually a really great example. I linked it in the chat if you want to look at it. And it does have three different organizations or partners that work towards it and actually a huge amount of staff. I think when I had to scroll to see the entire staff, I said, we can't do this with six people. So we had to move on. But yes, it's, it seems like a really huge project. And I don't know what the long term funding looks like for it and how often they update it. So thanks. Thank you. Kate. I just wanted to first say awesome presentation. Um, my name is Kate Bell. I primarily in my scope of work right now, I'm more in the renewable energy space. So admittedly less knowledgeable in the coastal resilience area. Um, but one thing that's relevant to my work and I think is uh, relevant as well for coastal resilience issues is that there's so much an individual municipality can control both in terms of their capacity, but also you know, a shared resource, um, even if you do everything you possibly can as a local government, you're still sharing a coastline with other communities. Um, and even if you're doing everything, you know, right, if other communities aren't necessarily following suit, uh, your community could be impacted by the lack of action or just lack of coordination in, uh, in that area. And so I was wondering, I'm excited to read the report. Um, it looks really, really interesting but wondering to what extent in your research or recommendations you have for marking that delineation for what individual municipalities are able to control and what makes sense for them to do versus resources that are more appropriate for regional collaboration. Um, I think especially for our Great Lakes communities, we're often sharing um, you know, a, a lakefront, not only with another state, but oftentimes another entire country. So wondering to what extent uh, those resources are being marked for here is what you as an individual municipality who has dedicated their time, treasure and talent to devoting, uh, you know, to this issue versus this is something that might be more relevant for a county government or a uh, um, uh, an international type of collaboration because I am seeing a thousand resources listed that's more than any one person or any one government can really parse through but if there's any sort of delineation for this makes sense for you as one local government entity to pursue versus others that we can lend our time to collaborating with our county government but this isn't within our control so just wondering it to what extent you saw that happen or if you have recommendations specific to making those uh, clear uh, delineations for people who are trying to find out what to do. Yeah, I can hop in here first. So to give you a sense of our process, we did provide explicit target audiences for our recommendations. So each recommendation in the report has a recommended actor to carry out that strategy of action. Um, and then also in our resources library, we did have a column that target that identifies who the target audience is. So we did try our best in that process to identify who the resources are targeted at. But I think your question was excellent and really hits at one of the challenges that we found is that municipalities are often self-interested actors in this space to no fault of their own. Like they're trying to satisfy their taxpayers and their voters and keep folks happy. But having that self-interested mindset can be really detrimental to neighboring communities and to moving the needle on this in the entire space. So one of our recommendations is obviously to build a lot of these communities of practice. Someone did just link one in the chat, Chaos, which is excellent. They're doing awesome work, but that is just one sliver of the coast and making sure that there are these networks that municipalities can tap into to better initiate these collaboratives between different municipalities and identify opportunities for uh, planning agencies and other boundary organizations or regional level organizations to take that leadership. Kat, do you have anything to add? 
Um, yes, I think I did want to add a little bit. And I know I, I did hear so much about the capacity that municipalities had. Like it was, it was a significant portion of the most interviews. Um, and even people with like the most well-intentioned, they admitted, and we have quotes from that said like, you can try as hard as you possibly can, but it truly comes down to like, you just don't have the capacity to do your best or what you think would be your best. Um, we did see some examples though of municipalities also collaborating together. And there are other examples that we list in our recommendations as well. Um, and in our future user facing report, which is coming out, we've taken some of the recommendations that we had for research providers and flipped them because some of them would say like, oh, you should do research on long term, like and do long-term monitoring. But it's really like, if someone ever says that there's long-term monitoring and you're, you, you're a municipality that you should try to engage with it and try to help and promote that in the area. So we did try to flip some of those resource provider recommendations. So they would be applicable to municipalities as well. Um, and yeah, I don't know, that'd be my answer, so. Great, thank you. Great, thanks, Kate. I wanted to address the question that Jim or the comment that Jim had in the chat about resources for private property owners is a huge issue and um, providing financial support for them. In our full report, we talk about a few examples of uh, alternatives to funding and how we've done that because it's really hard to, or there's not many options for using state or federal funding to pay for private property owners to fix up their I guess their shoreline, with the exception of the CLEAR initiative out of New York. However, um, we did have examples of how municipalities had worked together to form special improvement districts so they could actually take on loans that were shared across multiple municipalities, like upwards of over 10, to take on those million, multi-million dollar loans to pay for people's, uh, I guess, softening or hardening of their shorelines or protecting them as well. And I think we have another example, and there's probably been many other webinars put on by NOAA and also the city's initiative of examples that other um, municipalities had have done or used to find funding. So yeah, thank you. All right, well, we're just about at time. So this is really awesome uh, discussion here, taking us all the way to time. So it's great to see that. Um, thank you, Andrea and Kat and other students on the team that I know are listening in today. Really great to hear from you and see your results and very much so looking forward to taking a deeper dive into the full report. So thanks everyone for coming and hope you have a great um, rest of your week.